I'm Jessica Berry with Dermatology Times, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Jonathan Silverberg about a talk that he recently gave at the Revolutionizing Atopic Dermatitis Virtual Symposium earlier this month. Um, thank you for speaking with me today, Dr. Silverberg. Um, sure, it's my pleasure. I wanted to talk to you specifically about the presentation you gave entitled Atopic Dermatitis, When to Suspect Systemic Disease or Alternate Diagnoses. Um, would you be able to go over a little bit of what you covered and some of the main takeaways that uh, dermatologists should keep in mind? Sure. Um, you know, we atopic dermatitis in of itself is um, not always such an easy diagnosis to make. You know, we often think that it's a simple diagnosis in, in children because there aren't that many other diagnoses that will happen. And most commonly, atopic dermatitis is the... Uh, going to be the diagnosis uh, in, in children. But as you, especially as you move into the adults and even within uh, children, there are other diagnoses that need to be thought about. Um, and so there's, there's sort of differential diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. There's also those things that can happen together with atopic dermatitis where you can have classic presentation of atopic dermatitis, but there's also something else going on. And so there's sort of two broad scenarios to be thinking about. Um, so I think the, you know, the, the first thing to just kind of recognize is not all atopic dermatitis is flexural. Um, there's plenty of times when it's not, and specifically in certain racial and ethnic subsets, but not everything that's flexural is also atopic dermatitis. And um, there are, are uh, case reports out there of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and allergic contact dermatitis in particular presenting uh, with flexural involvement and even uh, lichen planus pigmentosus. So, you know, there's other scenarios that can come up that we need to think about, even with that classic flexural involvement. But some of the key scenarios that we most commonly, you know, think about um, as being at least concerning for an alternate diagnosis or an overlapping diagnosis would be even when it looks like garden variety atopic dermatitis, but when patients present with head and neck involvement, um, there certainly is lots of head and neck involvement in atopic dermatitis but it could also be a sign of uh, superimposed irritant or allergic contact dermatitis or even an airborne contact dermatitis. So the distribution definitely is something we need to be thinking about. Um, we see different morphological characteristics that can come up when there's uh, follicular involvement. You need to be thinking about the possibility of uh, follicular MF, follicular trophic MF, mycosis fungoides. Um, sometimes you have to, to think about distinguishing from uh, you know, if there's extensor involvement, distinguishing from dermatitis or pediformis or psoriasis and other uh, inflammatory skin diseases that have that more uh, extensor distribution. Um, but I think the big ones you have to really be thinking about is making sure not to miss the allergic contact dermatitis and or other inflammatory skin disease diagnoses. Um, but it's also, you know, uh, important to uh, recognize that there are other things that can sometimes give that light pink, subtle, ill demarcated lesion and even present with flexural involvement um, that looks just like atopic derm, but it's not. And one that comes up not uncommonly would actually be systemic lupus, where cutaneous lupus can sometimes look almost identical to that of atopic dermatitis. And that's where really taking a thorough history and physical uh, can be helpful to sort of identify those other uh, signs and symptoms of autoimmune disease. Um, you know, if there's a, some kind of history of contagious component, you need to be thinking about the possibility of scabies, of course. Um, and certainly if there's an acute exacerbation and it's look, you know, you have these ulcerative lesions, think about possibility of infections. Um, and then I think also the other one that's very important is if it doesn't respond predictably to the therapies that usually work, always rethink the diagnosis and make sure you're not missing something. Things change, even patients with a history of lifelong atopic dermatitis, things may evolve and they may develop some other a diagnosis, maybe MF later in life, maybe contact dermatitis. And it's really important to be thinking about that. So, you know, this year we did the, uh, the, the uh, RAD meeting, the Revolutionizing Atopic Dermatitis meeting as a virtual meeting given everything that's going on with uh, the COVID outbreaks. Uh, but we are looking forward to uh, having the live meeting in December in Chicago. It should be, I think, the first weekend of December in Chicago. And um, 
it, uh, I believe, will be a very uh, jam-packed and fun program, uh, really um, looking at the state of the art in atopic dermatitis for clinicians. Great. Thank you so much for speaking with me, Dr. Silverman.